Speech making is a prop to the visual images. In tracing the intellectual decline in presidential rhetoric, Elvin T. Lim reveals a few of the deceptive tricks of the speechwriter's trade. Speeches are littered with inspirational platitudes to convey the appearance of a serious message without saying anything specific at all. Speeches are filled with assertive language to make it appear that the speaker is a bold and confident leader. Speeches are written with anti-intellectual rhetoric so that the candidate will sound like and appear to be a typical American in the expectation that voters will be fooled into concluding that he will work for typical Americans. Speeches are filled with carefully veiled partisan punchlines deploying code words vague enough so as not to galvanize opposition and preempt deliberation, but pointed enough to stroke partisan emotions. A dramatic illustration of the phoniness of political speech may be gleaned when we juxtapose political speeches. Among the many qualities of character many of us desire in a president is what President George H.W. Bush dismissively called the vision thing. The ability to communicate a vision for a better future and inspire voters to achieve it. As an example, on Decoration Day in 1888, Robert Ingersoll began all six of his concluding paragraphs, excerpts which follow, with the phrase, I see. I see our country filled with happy homes, with firesides of content, the foremost land of all the earth. I see a world where thrones have crumbled and where kings are dust. I see a world without a slave. I see a world at peace. I see a world without the beggar's outstretched palm. I see a race without disease of flesh or brain. But if a candidate doesn't have a vision, speechwriters can certainly give the appearance of one. On November 2, 1940, in Cleveland, Ohio, Franklin Roosevelt appropriated Ingersoll's visionary motif by beginning seven of 13 successive sentences in his last address of the campaign with the phrase, I see an America. 28 years later, in his acceptance speech before the Republican National Convention on August 8, 1968, in Miami Beach, Florida, presidential candidate Richard Nixon began eight sentences in succession with the phrase, I see a day. Eight years later, in his speech on June 1, 1976, in Los Angeles, California, presidential candidate Jimmy Carter began ten sentences in succession with the phrase, I see an America. Thirty-two years later, in her remarks on February 9, 2008, at the Virginia Jefferson Jackson dinner, presidential candidate Hillary Clinton began six of twelve successive sentences with the phrase, I see in America. When a candidate's speechwriters lift whole sections from others, it proves the phoniness of their words. They have no vision, but they want to appear visionary. That it is all an act was exemplified by the Obama campaign during the 2008 Democratic primaries. On February 16, 2008, candidate Barack Obama said, Don't tell me words don't matter. I have a dream, just words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, just words. We have nothing to fear but fear itself, just words. Just speeches. Sixteen months previously, on October 15, 2006, Massachusetts Democratic gubernatorial candidate Devil Patrick said, <laughs> But her dismissive point, and I hear it a lot from her staff, is that uh, all I have to offer is words. Just words. We hold these truths to be self evident. We have nothing to fear but fear.
In defending himself from the charge of plagiarism, Obama said, The notion that I had plagiarized from somebody who was one of my national co-chairs, who gave me the line and suggested that I use it, I think is silly. The charge of plagiarism was silly. The actual charge, however, was not that words don't matter, but rather that they should be your words that honestly convey your thought. Logician David Kelly reminds us that rhetoric and other emotive devices are fallacious only when rhetoric replaces logic, only when the intent is to make an audience act on emotion instead of rational judgment. But Obama's admission that he was given a line is an admission that political speeches are mostly theatrical lines of script given to a performer and that the words spoken in a campaign are mere rhetoric. Words crafted to equivocate, flatter, or seduce. Not words employed to facilitate public deliberation. Former White House speechwriter John R. Coyne offers a perspective valuable to us. My experience as a speechwriter has taught me that national politicians often have little to do with what they say. And this, in turn, has taught me that it is nearly impossible to arrive at conclusions about the reality of the political man beneath the surface of his rhetoric, or conclusions about the principles to which that man holds by analyzing his rhetoric. I have learned, in other words, that it is extremely easy to confuse the substance with the shadow, the trappings with the center, the rhetoric with the reality. Consider a very small and harmless but average instance. During the campaign of 72, the heckling began to get heavy. Agnew asked us to come up with something that would give our supporters in the crowds sufficient reason to shout down the hecklers. On the plane from Washington to Wilmington, Delaware, I wrote a little essay lecture on the necessity for civility in a democratic society. In Wilmington, when the heckling began, Agnew flipped to the end of his speech text and read the essay lecture on civility. The crowd loved it, shouted down the hecklers, and even the press was impressed, for it seemed spontaneous. The New York Times wrote about it this way. It was Mr. Agnew at his rhetorical best, establishing a simple premise, expanding it to broader, more philosophical planes, moving to a terse, sharp conclusion, and those who had come to hear him and cheer him loved every word. Well, fine. But the problem here, if I can be just a bit immodest, is that it was actually me, at my rhetorical and philosophical best. It was Mr. Agnew reading, at his reading and acting best. I have come to agree with Walter Lippmann about speeches and speechwriters, and I think his observation applies to most of the other functionaries who surround men of power. Lippmann put it this way, A public man can and needs to be supplied with material advice and criticism in preparing an important address. But no one can write an authentic speech for another man. It is as impossible as writing his love letters for him or saying his prayers for him. When he speaks to the people, he, and not someone else, must speak. The truth is that anyone who knows what he is doing can say what he is doing, and anyone who knows what he thinks can say what he thinks. Those who cannot speak for themselves are, with very few exceptions, not very sure of what they are doing and of what they mean. The sooner they are found out, the better.